at least from my point of view as I'm speaking, um, I'm thinking about this as the, the unfolding meta crisis. And so the, the rolling out of the virus and our response to the virus is an aspect of the meta crisis, but there's in the second order and third order effects, many of which are going to be as impactful. And so it's the whole thing. So when I think about that, um, and we spoke about this earlier in the context of, of New York City, that there's effectively at the very top this choice between do we respond to this by breaking uh, into, to, by balkanizing into us versus them, or do we respond to this by coming together into we? Right? And, and in many ways, that's the most important piece. Um, and you, you talked about the fact that you have a sense uh, that, that the UK has a, both an instinct and a capability mm -hmm. of, of coming back together into a we under times of crisis well, and you think they will. Yeah, I think I'd like to recap that because we're, we're talking about stuff we, we discussed mm -hmm. just yeah. before we started recording. But yeah, my sense, and I've always had this sense, is that the UK, there is such a thing as a coherence of the national conversation in the UK. It's sort of held, it's held in various places, it's held in the centrality of the of the, the fact that the media and the, and the politicians all went to the same universities. It's held in the centrality of London. It's held in the BBC. It's held, there's, there's just a kind of coherence to the national conversation. Um, and it's obviously on a deeper level held within sort of very British values of, um, which have been sort of tested recently, but sort of fair play and all of those kind of traditional British values. And I do get a sense of coherence that I don't get from the American conversation, which is really, like the American can talent is like dialectic. It's, and that's what drives America forward, but it's also a, it's also a centripetal, is that? Centripetal mm -hmm. or centrifugal? One of the two. Petal. Centripetal force that pulls apart. Um, so that's my sense of what a, a yeah. America, or no, I think it's centrifugal, I think. I think you're right, the centrifuge pulls <laughs> things apart. Yeah, the centrifuge. Um, yeah. So yes, and, and I think we can actually get even a starker relief. So uh, in the past 48 hours, uh, Serbia, <laughs> kind of the archetype of balkanization, um, the president said, you know, Europe, it turns out Europe was just talk. Like we cannot get any help from Europe. They're not sending us support. They're not sending us masks, they're not sending us ventilators. Europe, everybody in Europe is sort of pulling back and taking care of themselves and letting everybody else ride. We must rely on our brothers in China. Okay, so the European experiment. So if you look at like, uh, you know, in, in the U.S. is a highly heterogeneous country, particularly in comparison to any other nation, is by far the most heterogeneous. Uh, but Europe is, as itself, is also heterogeneous as a unit, mm -hmm. and doesn't really have any tradition of being able to come together into a synthesis. So, one, it's a very reasonable expectation that the European experiment is now deeply, deeply in trouble because the people are beginning to realize the only way for them to take care of themselves is to take care of themselves um, with the possible exception that we might see Germany do something extremely powerful and ramp up something that can actually support Europe as a whole. Um, and that would be, by the way, a very interesting turnabout, like the, the final, like, okay, it turns out in, when, it, when the chips, hit, uh, when, it, when the shit hits the fan, it's not World War I, it's not World War II. The Germans are also able to be the guys who pull things together. That'd be a, a, good, a good result. Um, and then, okay, so that's Europe and, and this notion of like, okay, wow, Serbia really showing us what balkanization really means, like what's the opposite of uh, a collective conversation. And then we have the, the American side. Right? And the American side, we have this, uh, well, frankly, it's very fractal. Right? So, so I mentioned that New York is just going super critical, right? The number of cases are, are steeply accelerating, uh, probably because of detection, not because of <laughs> spread. Uh, but the felt sense of, of that is hitting. But my, my intuition actually feels confident. My, my intuition feels confident because there's those characteristics of New York City in particular, that you've got a bunch of people who at the end of the day are very practical and very hard edged. Like they, they like to get shit done. Like the formality of conversation in New York is funny. You, you like within 30 seconds, if you are not talking about something that is worth my time, get the fuck out of here. Um, but two, they actually have a sense of we. Like to be a New Yorker is a thing. And you can look across the line and see a guy who's, you know, two generations ago, his, his, his ethnicity was, didn't speak the language, was somewhere completely else. And you, two generations ago, were also, but you're both fucking New Yorkers and you can help each other. And then third, they have the cultural memory of September 11th. 
So they actually have a, a, a lived sense of, oh, okay, we remember what crisis feels like and we remember what it feels like to come together as a, as a people. So the ability of, of New York City to respond is at least in potential very high. Um, but in many ways for America, this is how it goes. As you say, it's a, a question of, um, do we have the capacity, the willingness and the capacity to take all of the gradient, all the difference that's embedded in who we are and bring that back together into a higher synthesis, right? It's not a, this is the state and it's kind of cycles like this. It is a spiral, right? Mm -hmm. And if you just kind of look at our, our case history in 1776, yes. 80 years later in 1860, no. 80 years later in 1940, yes. 80 years later in 2020, question mark. All right, so we're, we're, we're going to find out. Mm. And um, I mean, we were saying just before as well that I uh, certainly my sense, and I think you agree, is that this is going to play out very differently in different countries because it's going to test. It's going to basically stress test the society. It's going to stress test the culture. It's going to stress test the um, the mimetic complex that we call national identity. It's like the, this set of characteristics. And I think it's going to play out very differently in different countries, depending on that. Yeah, it's funny. Like you, you can even say that it's a bit of a uh, how would you how would you name it? It's like um, I guess the good, best metaphor I can use is that notion of like a sonar ping, um, because you get this this, this this shape of almost like the the interior of a culture. So compare like very, like we have to be very very precise. Let's compare Singapore to China. Hmm. Well, so if you look at the China's response, and by the way, I'm not going to run the model that the Chinese are actually acting in a uh, strategic Machiavellian manner. I'm just going to run in the model that's kind of like they're acting as they, they themselves would like to be best perceived. So in the Chinese response, you have something like corruption, bureaucracy, political maneuvering leading to a very bungled response where whistleblowers were shut down. And, and city leaders who knew stuff were, were directed not to share things for too long. And by the way, let's be very careful. Uh, under that model, the world has this because of that. Right? It got big enough in China that it did spread globally. But then, right, once, once a, a pivot point happened, the Chinese response kicked into the other side, which showed up as a really tr amazingly, remarkably harsh level of shutdown. Like, people being like police just going door to door to giant apartment buildings and literally just welding them shut, right? No voluntary quarantine, no fuck that. In China, they just lock your ass into the apartment building and good luck to you. And people on the streets just being grabbed and thrown into cars, like right? the, uh, the level of capacity there was high. Now, net net, it seems like it worked, right? So that we can look at the Chinese model and say, huh, on the one hand, we get a sense of what that approach looks like, you know, a very uh, you know, high corruption and high bureaucratic and, and cover your ass indifference, followed by super harsh, top down, almost ruthless levels of, of, of protection from the top. And it results in um, X level of impact. Look at Singapore, by contrast. You know, the Singapore right now is still the kind of probably the most well oiled machine on the planet. And they simultaneously reacted almost instantly as soon as there was a real threat. Everything shut down. It did not shut down with significant ruthlessness, but it did shut down with enormous completeness. And kind of still is. Like they've done an, the, probably the best job on the planet. Uh, and there's something about the nature of Singapore that has that. They're still a very hardwired, but somewhat smooth, <clears throat> kind of well integrated command and control infrastructure. You look at Korea, you look at Japan. I think we're going to go globally. So you get this very interesting perspective on the one hand of getting like a, how, is it, how would I say this, like a open kimono insight into the true nature of how a culture really operates in response to crisis. Mm. Um, and a, you know, for whether, whether we like it or not, a, uh, a, a, a revelation of the reality of that culture's current capacity. Mm. And let's, let's sort of recap the, we, we, you mentioned the meta crisis. So maybe let's, and we've featured you talking about it on the channel before, but obviously now it just, just has a kind of ramped up relevance. And I think maybe more people are starting to realize exactly what it was that uh, was trying to be talked about. Do you want to kind of outline where you think we are in the meta crisis and what you even mean by that in this context of just the <coughs> that people and most people are focused on right now? Sure. 
Um, so the, the, the concept is, is to point out, I guess, a couple of things. I'll, you know, to start at the top and work down. So at the top is the, is the, the recognition that we live in a nested set of many different systems that are all part of a larger system and are connected in very complex ways. And this is sort of has always been the case, but quite often we don't have to pay that much attention. Right? So the um, kind of the classic case in point right now is that we don't usually think about a, uh, a, a viral crisis, like a truly health crisis as also being an economic crisis. A bunch of people getting sick is a thing that, that the doctors and the CDC are supposed to worry about. And we're kind of worried about whether or not and how many people get sick and how bad that is. And we think about our own personal health and the people we, we think we love. We don't imagine that the people at the Federal Reserve Board should be watching that crisis very closely because those aren't the kind of same kind of thing. Right? They should be watching interest rates and real estate prices and stuff like that. And yet, of course, they're connected. And there's a, a transition where the, call it the subsystem, the, the part of our larger system that kind of takes health very seriously and looks at it very closely, um, it gets overwhelmed. And the consequences, the impacts, call it just from an economic perspective, the externalities of that subsystem start throwing externalities out into other subsystems, which now need to be paid attention to. And if you're not paying attention to them, you get blindsided. You just get whacked in the back of the head because you weren't looking at that. You were looking here and that just slammed you. Um, so at the meta level, the point is that, uh, and this is the, the, the hypothesis that I've been operating under for now for about 15 years, is that this has been going on for a long time, in fact. It just hasn't been acute. It's been chronic. So in the 2008 financial crisis in America, as a financial crisis, um, had a systemic infection where it spread from the United States to Europe and then spread from Europe to China and then kind of cascaded around. We're like, oh, oh all right, we forgot. Each country's economy and each country's financial system is connected to all the rest, to a global financial system. And we have to be able to think about that as a whole system, which as far as I can tell, we very distinctly failed at. And we're actually worse at managing it as a whole system now than we were in 2008. Um, but equally, uh, we see that there's a, there was a spillover effect, that the way that we responded to in, in, in the States to the 2008 to 2010 crisis and the way that in, the, in, in Europe they responded to the 2010 to 2015 crisis spilled over into the social and political domain. Uh, we, got, we got the Tea Party and eventually we got Trump. From that, I think it's very important for people to re recognize that the causal structure that leads to Trump begins, well, it doesn't begin, but has a big push in the financial system in 2008. And the causal structure that leads to Brexit begins, or at least has a very strong causal connection to the European debt crisis and how that was responded to. The way that banks were bailed out um, and the technocrats really did um, push harm to people and protect uh, proximal institutions created a big deep sense of don't trust those guys. And that cascaded out. So that's been going on. And um, kind of to put a, a line in the middle, the, the theory is that, that there's a, a, a driver in our culture, our global culture, or at least in the dominant sense of like neoliberal globalism, that has a strong bias in the direction of optimization for efficiency of a specific set of metrics. So what that does is that that, that basic sort of fundamental deep driver gives you that metric at, at a high level. Right? So you can get GDP up, but at the cost of fragility, it holds, you, you get one metric optimized at the cost of other metrics, other things that matter being down-regulated or at least made vulnerable. Mm. And so you become fragile. Um, and you don't necessarily notice fragility until something heavy or hard or fast hits the system. Okay, so you have to combine these two. One is that we actually have a whole bunch of different systems that are actually deeply interconnected, but in ways that we oftentimes don't watch, and in some cases aren't even aware of. And then two, we've been going through the process for seven decades 
of, of trying to optimize these subsystems, which makes the systems and the meta system increasingly fragile. Okay. So now we have today. Um, what I would say is that what we're experiencing right now was baked in. This was going to happen. It was just waiting for the right um, event, right? the right perturbation, the right magnitude of effect to hit a subsystem uh, with enough speed and or impact that it began the process of creating cascade effects that hit other subsystems and pushing beyond their fragility levels so that they began to break and throw externalities into still more subsystems, right? So it's a cascade failure across different, literally different modal systems. So it's one thing for like the finance system in the US to hit the finance system in the UK, because at least they're both finance and we can kind of like think about them in the same way. It's a little bit harder when the finance system hits the economic system, because sometimes we can't even distinguish between the two and recognize they're very different. But it's a real deal when the finance system, say, hits the health system. And we really have a hard time even thinking about how they relate. So, so all of that is precursor to saying, okay, right now where we are is we are witnessing in real time that happening, that, that fragility being revealed in uh, very complex relationships in subsystems. So let's be very concrete. Um, the number of beds per capita makes a big difference to how your country will weather the viral storm. Right? One of the weak points is what's called medical system overwhelm. And it's funny how like we can watch the culture evolve. A month ago, that phrase, medical system overwhelm, didn't really exist. <laughs> more and more people began to look around and say, oh shit, that's the thing that matters. And then the name spreads. We now have a concept, medical system overwhelm, which is to say, the UK just recently sort of published a big paper that talks about this in a big way. If I've got a medical system that is designed to be able to handle, you know, 10 ICU cases per thousand people, Per month, and I suddenly jump to 11. Um, it's kind of like this phase transition where I've got a, a, a pint glass. That's what you guys drink, right? Pints. Yeah. And um, you know, I'm filling it up with beer. There's a period of time where it's just sort of more and more full. No real, like whatever. It's all it's all kind of the same dynamic. It's half full. It's three quarters full. These are also variations of full. But once it actually hits 100% full, I go through a phase transition where it's spilling beer all over the floor. And that's a different kind of thing, right? Now, instead of just sort of closing the tap and handing it to somebody, I have to think about, oh shit, how do I scramble? Do I clean it up? You know, externalities are spilled into the, into the pub. So if I've got a medical system that's designed to handle 10 ICU beds per thousand people, but then I have a, 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 an epidemic that suddenly moves me to 11, that 11th bed isn't just plus one. Now I actually have a completely different dynamic because I don't have the capacity to give them the medical care that they need. Like, where are they? If they're not in an ICU bed, where are they? Are they like thrown into a tent outside or they just left dying on the floor? Like what, what's happening there? And they get to the 12th, the 13th, the 14th, the 15th. And we've seen this very practically in uh, mortality statistics. You know, in places where the medical system is not overwhelmed, the mortality statistics tend to be vectoring into less than 1%. In places where the medical system is overwhelmed, they tend to be vectoring towards greater than 5%. That's a big switch. Right? And that's just a very, and that's like not necessarily even the thing that matters. It's a nice sort of visceral, hard uh, point. You see that. Okay, so the, the number of beds per thousand people around the world varies quite widely. I believe Korea was somewhere around 10 or higher, whereas the U.S. is, is around two. Well, why is that? Well, the reason for that is because the American medical system has been optimizing for efficiency um, for a long time. And so up until now, two has been kind of good enough. We've never run into a situation where we needed more than two. And in holding an extra ICU bed when you don't need it has an extra cost basis, which decreases the bottom line. So this is like a long-term impact of the financial system, and by the way, also the governance system, conspiring to lead to fragility at the level of the medical system which we didn't really have to deal with until we had to deal with it, which is right now. So that's a one piece. It's very concrete in which we're running into. Well, I mean, that's a lot. I just said a whole bunch of words. I don't know how much of it is uh, coherent or how much of it lands, but maybe uh, what's next? Yeah, I mean, we, we could use that point to expand from there, really, because, I mean, that, that seems to me to be the most constructive 
large frame to use, which is that we've got a system that optimizes for, for efficiency, therefore takes all of the slack out of the system. By definition, you then don't have much resilience in any of the systems because any extra capacity would be would be surplus to requirements, therefore inefficient. So you you create, by definition, like fragile systems all over the place. Yep. And by the way, so we're, we're going to go deep. Do you mind going deep here? Let's go deep. Um, these are super fundamental concepts. This is the kind of stuff that I should have been putting in my own channel. All right. The evolution. You know, we, uh, I use evolution like Brett often to make sense of things. In this case, it's very important. So the saber-toothed tiger is optimized for efficiency. It's very fragile to changes in its niche. And it goes extinct. So what happens is this. If I have a niche, if I have a, uh, an environment that stays relatively static for a long enough period of time, what ends up happening is that the way to be successful is to find a niche and then to optimize for efficiency in that niche. Because right? there's no point in holding things that don't, aren't valuable because it's been long enough that change ain't going to come. And right? so you know, the saber-toothed tiger that sort of doesn't have the long teeth and has the shorter teeth is less effective in the context of a particular environment than the one that has the long teeth. So it keeps selecting for longer and longer teeth, bigger body mass, whatever the characteristics are that make it the peak predator now. Okay. And so niches that stay static for a long enough period of time, and by long enough, what I mean is literally in relationship to the evolutionary cycle of the underlying organism. So for saber toothed tigers, they have a reproductive rate and a mutation rate. So if you have like a million years of the same environment, you're going to get uh, very optimized uh, organisms. And in evolutionary theory, it's very clear, we know that very optimized organisms are also very fragile organisms, which means that um, a relatively small change in the environment leads to a catastrophic effect on their genome, which is to say extinction. And so if you say like for the, for the, for the hedgehog, when the environment changes by 10%, the hedgehog actually only has a 2% decrease in reproductive effectiveness because it's actually a relatively generalized creature. Whereas the saber-toothed tiger, with a 10% in change in the niche, it goes to zero. It just completely goes away because it's kind of sitting on top of this extremely rarefied, very particular thing. And of course, the actual inverse is true. Where the environment is changing relatively commonly, you get these creatures that are super generalized, which is more or less how humans resulted. Right? We happen to emerge in an environment where we kept going through situations where the polar, you know, the, the ice ages kept coming and going and coming and going. And we we're kind of going from a place where we had lush forests and then suddenly like grasslands with trees in between and then deserts and then back in. And, you know, only those toolkits that were able to maintain the sort of efficiency of generality were able to, to survive at all. And then each bottleneck kicked that off to the next day. Okay. And remind me, by, by the way, I've got one more major conceptual toolkit that needs to be dropped in, but I'll finish this one. So one of the things that happened in, in, in the world is more or less after World War II, and particularly after the fall of, the, uh, of communism, we had two dynamics that, that hooked together. Uh, one was an entrainment, meaning that, that what would, had otherwise been a whole bunch of different niches that were behaving differently like we talked about earlier, France being France and Germany being Germany and the UK being the UK, suddenly started gluing together into one meta niche. So a company that Peugeot, which perhaps was effective as an organism inside France, suddenly was not as effective in an organism called global trade. You know, Daimler-Benz and Toyota were just more competitive. And so in the context of the global, this new sort of global niche, local uh, organisms suddenly started evaporating. They just couldn't compete. You start getting this entrainment of one giant niche. And the second thing we had was this thing called the great moderation, where the intentional, deliberate, and effective use of regulatory capacity uh, was able to maintain a stasis of niche for a long enough time relative to the reproductive mutation uh, rate of of uh, human cultural and social organisms that we became 
fragile. And I mean that not only at the level of systems, I also mean that at the level of institutions. So, for example, somewhere in the late 70s, we should have actually had a big handoff of socio-technical responsibility from the 50s era mentality and organizational structure and in fact individuals to a rising wave, literally in a different biological generation, but also a different economic and, and uh, technological generation of techniques. Right? The, the wave of digital capacity and peer-to-peer -peer communication that we're trying to figure out now should actually have gone through a normal childhood in the 70s and by the 90s should have that in fact have been handed off a, in a what's that called a peaceful transition of power capacity which would have been ended by the way sort of the banking system would have more or less gone away because we don't actually need banks that concept is a very mid-century concept the banks that we as we currently understand them i'm hoping that's your mom <laughs> it's so, perfect Rafi, no it's Rafi's wife marguerite it's perfect, right? This is, this is uh, yesterday I was having a conversation with John Verbeke and my daughter came and sat on my lap, like this interpenetration of the, of the real, like our real lives, this kind of notion of the artificiality of the office is going away and we're all sort of in our homes, which is part of the cultural evolution we're going through. Um, so what we got instead was this, this sort of continuous doubling down on the optimization for a artificially constrained niche, you know, for example, the banking system, the financial system, which became saber tooth tigers everywhere. Right? If you didn't dispense with resilience inside your banking system and double down on derivatives trading, you were not as effective in competing for alpha and beta as the guy next to you. And so you got selected against and everybody became saber tooth tigers. Right? And so that's very important. Um, and let me re 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 say that again to make sure it really lands. Um, that, that I actually described two different dynamics that happened. One was an artificially constrained longer than it could and should have been duration of a niche, like the saber tooth tiger's niche, which generated an enormous amount of selective evolution into highly optimized structures. And by the way, optimized for that artificially constrained niche. And it's very important to say artificially constrained because the the forces of change were building up it's like you're talking about with france right france the french language like this notion of we're going to use a human institution the academy to hold the language from evolving and hold it and hold it and hold it but the forces of change are building up technology is changing culture is changing the times are changing and so it ends up happening that environment is that it doesn't elegantly move it actually just has to shatter and you have kind of a breaking event and then change happens all like willy-nilly and then some new state hit and that's kind of what happened, right? We had a, a, a whole bunch of governance institutions that had the capacity and the, uh, and the intent to manage the globe. Hey, we don't want bad things to ever happen again to anyone. Um, and they were effectively able to kind of hold change from happening. And they held it and held it and held it. What they did is they pushed change out from a, from a sort of an elegant, smooth movement to this building up on the outside of the dam. Inside the dam, we had artificial sameness, which caused these saber-toothed tigers to evolve in all of our niches, our academic system, our medical system, our governance system, our scientific academies. You know, Eric Weinstein has been hammering at this saying, why in the world have our journalistic and our academic institutions been increasingly steered by guys who were born in the 1940s and 50s? What, why isn't there any fresh blood coming in at literally just a human level? And this is why, this is why. So what happens is we put ourselves in a situation where when change comes, it's gonna come hard. Like there's suddenly the dam bursts, like the levees bursting in Katrina in New Orleans. And it bursts into an environment where all the resilience has been sucked out of the system. So it breaks and breaks and breaks and breaks and breaks and breaks. Um, okay, so that was a big conceptual payload. And if anybody landed it, I think you're gonna get a whole lot of orientation about why we're where we are, where we are, and what's likely to continue to happen. And by the way, if this particular event doesn't break through all the rip stops and tear things apart, it's just a matter of time, unless we figure out how to reverse the polarity and begin to actually evolve again and rebuild resilient uh, anti-fragile capacities. Yeah, I'd like to in a moment talk about 
the, the, the stress and the crisis of sort of making sense of it uh, and how, how kind of the media and the collective intelligence have shown up. But just before we do that, I'd love to recap. You said something, I saw a, a, a talk you gave a couple of days ago where you talked about addiction and the similarities between denial that have been showing up. I'd love, I'd love to hear that piece for, for our audience. Oh, yeah. Okay, well, that's, I mean, that's another conceptual model, and it's important, and it's, and it's a big one that fits in here as well. And it really um, resonated but, with me because I've been dealing with, like, having, yeah. like, close personal experience of that dynamic of, of denial, of denial of reality, and then kind of that moment of kind of realization. So, yeah, love to hear it. Yeah. All right, so, so we have, like, let's call it a, a baseline cycle, and unfortunately, I don't, I don't know the name, so maybe you can find it and put it in a like, little subtext. I've forgotten the name, but it's the basic cycle of, you know, um, denial and acceptance and bargaining and all that stuff. Um, and this seems to be just a I natural... that's the Kubler-Ross uh, stages of grief? Yeah, yeah, that's right. That's exactly right. So there we go. Uh, so the Kubler-Ross stages of grief seems to be a part of just psychology. And frankly, there's probably really good reasons for it. It's been selected for over long periods of time in lots of different contexts. Um, and think of that as like the natural thing. So no matter what, when you run into something that's going to hit you with a big shift in change, you will go through that. So... Don't fight it, swim, swim with it. And so when you're feeling um, uh, really depressed by the realization that things are much worse than you thought, in some sense, if you can be metacognitively aware of the fact that you're in the right place and just kind of allow yourself to process that in the way it needs to be processed, so you can get into the other side of acceptance as smoothly as possible, not as quickly, you can't make it go faster than you can, uh, then, you're, then you're, you're doing as well as you can. And I want to put a particular note. I've noticed in myself at least four of these cycles. The last one was two days ago at 3 a.m. Um, so something's going on right now where this, the rate of change and the magnitude of change and the quality of change is such that acceptance, which is to say to begin to step into building an adaptive response to what is, actually finds itself yet again overwhelmed by a change of what is that is big enough in magnitude to require that you actually go through a whole new cycle. So that, that's kind of like, an unfortunately powerful part of what's happened. But then we actually have a different dynamic, and this is the dynamic of addiction, which has to do mostly with denial. So this is a breakdown of our sense-making and choice-making system where reality hits us. And, and I think it's actually not, it's this, it's this Cooper-Ross system, but a particular subset of what happens. It's a, uh, a reciprocal closing of Verbeke, as Verbeke describes it. So reality hits us. Um, and we kind of have a choice. We can either deal with the, this cycle, deal with the, the unpleasantness of this cycle and the, and the necessity of actually changing our behavior, or we can bullshit ourselves. Right? And we have that choice. And if we happen to have, in some sense, the privilege, the benefit of being able to bullshit ourselves and not have reality really kick us in the teeth, it's all too easy to bullshit ourselves. And if the magnitude of change that we have to go through in the context of reality feels uncomfortable enough, right? So we get this kind of separation. This is why, by the way, uh, addiction can really, really hammer the wealthy because money allows you to buy not changing a lot easier. You don't hit rock bottom as, as painfully, um, which is kind of an odd thing. Like oftentimes people who don't have resources get you know, it, it gets really bad because they do hit rock bottom, but the amount of sort of what gets pulled with them in, in duration in life um, may in fact be shorter cycle. They hit rock bottom in years as opposed to in decades. But in any event, as a culture, this is particularly the case. So in the West, the max, the massive plenitude that we've been able to produce over the last 50 years, 70 years, has given us the ability to sort of kick the can down the road, to go into bullshitting ourselves and avoiding the uncomfortable reality of the necessity of changing what are in fact rather significant pieces of our behavior and our infrastructure and our institutions. And by the way, stepping into a lot of uncertainty. You know, change requires actually stepping away from certainty into uncertainty, and that by itself is uncomfortable. And of course, if you do that, if you bullshit yourself, reality, well, sometimes reality just goes away. Sometimes it actually works out. Sometimes the thing that you were trying to avoid thinking about actually does go away and you can yeah, I got away with it, which, by the way, reinforces the behavior. But generally speaking, it doesn't. Generally speaking, reality is reality. It doesn't really care how much you bullshit yourself. In fact, generally speaking, if you bullshit yourself, you do make matters worse. 
So, you know, the next day, reality comes knocking at the door and says, hey, it's time to change. You know, something just went wrong. Again, you're faced with a choice, but now you're kind of deeper in because the magnitude of your bullshit, the, the delusional story that you begin telling yourself and the, the self the self denial and uh, the narratives that you constructed to enable your bullshit um, have a bigger control over where you are. And you have to actually go through the feel, you have to feel all the discomfort that you've been delaying at once. So instead of being discomfort of one, now it's discomfort of three. So you have a choice. You go deeper into the rabbit hole and bullshit yourself even further, or do you suck it up and go through the even bigger magnitude of change you have to go through? Well, generally speaking, people will often choose the first path. And again, if you can get away with it, if you can throw more bullshit, let's just use like the financial system as a very concrete example. In 2008, reality hit us and said, you guys have been really fucking this up for a long time. The global financial system is not functional. It's hyper fragile. It's optimized for efficiency. It's making bad choices, bad resource allocation. Got to change this in a big way. Big banks got to go. Um, probably even centralized banks as a mechanism have got to go, this whole structure. <clears throat> and our global collective intelligence governance system said, oh, that sounds really painful. Nope, you know, I'd rather do, I'd like to take a double shot of, of heroin and, and amphetamines. Did we get a big shot of heroin and amphetamines? Well, yes, we can. Okay, good, let's do that instead. <laughs> um, and of course, over a period of time, I was like, well, that amphetamines wasn't enough. We need a lot more. Which is like... Uh, putting a load of money, quantitative easing, just basically printing money. Right. Yeah, let's, let's cut interest rates a quarter point. Well, that didn't work. Okay, let's cut it half a point. That didn't work. Let's go to zero interest rates. Well, that's not working anymore. Let's go to negative interest rates. It's that kind of that cycle. And the point of that stage is that each one of those decision points was a decision point where you could decide either to bullshit yourself more or suck it up and actually go through the change necessary to get to actual sobriety. And so at the level of the financial system, <clears throat> like. Uh, the reality had percolated through the crisis had kind of come enough to an end that by the time that we were sitting around in 2014, 2015, 2016, um, and, and our capacity for producing stimulants was strong enough that we went through a, a, a felt sense of another high. But it wasn't a real thing. Right? The underlying damage was pretty heavy. It's a little bit like you can imagine that you were running a race and uh, you, know, you like fell and sprained your ankle really badly. Um, but you just decided to wrap it up with some tape and then inject yourself with a combination of painkillers and stimulants and just went back running on the, on the ankle. Well, if you're under, if you're, when you're under the influence of the painkillers and the stimulants and the, the wrap is, is, is kind of good enough, you might actually be running pretty well, but you're doing damage to the ankle. And when the stimulants and the painkillers wear off, you're now even worse than you were before. So that's, that's what's happening right now in the financial system. The magnitude of what's being done right now in the U.S., and this is going to cascade globally, of course, is like a whole step up from everything that happened in the period between 2008 and 2012. Like it's like two or three times X already, and we're only four or five days in. Um, which is to say that we're just continuing to choose to bullshit ourselves. The, the addict is continuing to choose to update the delusional story. Whatever you do, don't pay attention to what's real. Um, and doubling down on the, the, uh, the stimulant, the, the thing that allows the system to continue to operate as if reality isn't what it is. Uh, and, you know, eventually, as every addict knows, you hit rock bottom. Um, and you always have a choice when you hit rock bottom. You have a moment of clarity. And the moment of clarity, you can finally choose to just take in, to get into complete acceptance. <laughs> and by the way, oftentimes, the, I believe the story is to uh, submit to a higher power, to surrender, and begin to say, okay, I really don't know how to deal with this. I need to actually begin learning from the beginning again and realize I got to take my lumps. I actually have to grow through the, sh the change that has to happen to get to, to sobriety and ultimately to health. Um, or you can go right back down to the de denial cycle until ultimately death, right? Um, and I think that's, again, that's a really good conceptual model. As we've done, we've kind of been moving back and forth between the individual human biological example and the financial example. Um, and by the way, if you'd like, you can transpose this to the, uh, the political side, for example. Um, but what would it look like for, like, if this is denial, what would it actually look like to, to face reality and what would the changes need to be? I, I mean, okay. <laughs> just, a, just a list rather than maybe no, going into kind of, yeah. 
Yeah, I've been, I've been, this is something that I've been looking at for now, again, about 15 years. So it's, it's actually not that, in some sense, not that mysterious. I've already, already laid out most of it. Yeah. Uh, the first is to accept you've got a problem. Let's do AA. Like the fucking AA guys have got it kind of wired. First, accept you've got a problem. Like stop denying that you've got a problem. Second, begin the process of coming into awareness and relationship with the, the reality of the problem. Like begin the process of actually stepping into reality. So in this case, for example, I would propose that it would be quite helpful to have a collective conscious acceptance of the reality of the meta crisis that I've been talking about. That the thing in front of us, the acute crisis, is a symptom of a much larger chronic crisis that has been ongoing for a long period of time. And to, to reach a level of acceptance of the magnitude of change, and in some sense, at least the qualities of change that need to occur. For example, if I'm a, a baby boomer who has been holding on to the reins of power of particular institutional structures for a long time, I think it's time to acknowledge the generational transfer is an actual necessity. I think it's time to acknowledge that the reality is, is that I don't really know what to do. And that's okay. It's not my job to know what to do. There are other people who are younger than me that have grown up in completely different environments that have better instincts and better learnings about the reality that we currently live in. It's their job to know what to do. Now, I may actually have a deeper connection to why if I've lived life well and full and thoroughly that I actually have developed embodied wisdom and I can start trying to present why. And this notion of we, who we might be, like the deep tradition, the deep tradition is still carried in my body in the way that younger people can't have. But the specific strategy and response that we ought to be engaging in, you know, okay, boomer is a archetypal and practical sign of the reality of that case. You're fucking out of the loop. You don't really understand what's going on in reality. And yet you're still clutching on to the reins of power with, uh, with my cold dead hands. That's just one example. I don't mean to harsh on that. That's just a very specific example. Two, if you happen to be in charge of a very large, powerful institution, it's time to recognize that institution probably needs to die. Sorry, big, too big to fail banks. The right response is you actually need to go away. That's just the reality. And I understand this is not an easy thing to do. It will be challenging. But doing it consciously, intentionally, and deliberately rather than with our hand forced by crisis coming from 15 different directions. And by the way, now geopolitical movement of other people realizing that weakness and crisis is an opportunity to take advantage of things. is just a better idea. So if we had back in 2008 recognized that the too big to fail, the response to too big to fail banks was no longer too big to fail banks in the world, we would be massively better off now. So that's another example. And by the way, education, want to pick, pick another poison? The global education system, particularly the American education system, the right response right now is to recognize that it's just a fucking mess, top to bottom. And this is not a matter of trying to tinker around the edges with different testing methodologies. It really is a time to say, okay, wow, I've actually got every American school child is no longer in school and possibly for the next six months. Now's the time to really think about hitting a reboot on the whole thing. And can we rapidly put, pull together an entirely different approach to education? And here's the thing, again, if you're running the education system, you don't know what the fuck to do. You've been focused on trying to figure out how to maintain the patient for so long that you maybe have real amazing expertise in maintaining the patient. But by definition, that means you haven't been spending a lot of time in yourself working on the way that you think about things and how to respond to new possibilities. But there are other people who have been. I think uh, Sam Oberja actually put it, I think, very precisely. The only appropriate response right now is hand the keys over to people who are both smart and brave. There are people who are smart, but are coward, cowardly. That's not going to help. There are people who are brave, but not smart. <laughs> That's not going to help either, although there's going to be some interesting consequences. But there are people who are both smart and brave, and, and many of them are out there. Like Again, if you kind of let's rewind all the way back to the beginning of our conversation, there were many people in social media who fucking called this thing. Their sense-making frameworks, their methodologies of, of kind of estimating risk and, and sorting through the noise worked. They saw what was happening, and they actually were able to propose appropriate responses in a time frame where it would have been a very easy thing to deal with. And we don't have to sort of lurch from crisis to crisis. <clears throat> but the powers that be right now have neither the capacity nor the willingness to 
give them the keys. Right? So it's, it's a big deal, right? And this has already happened though. This has happened in the past. In uh, the period of World War I and World War II, the old guard of the, of the Victorian era went through a process of demoralization in, in, the, in World War I, a process of trying to hold on to control using old techniques in the period between the wars that eventually was completely destabilized and, and a meta crisis, which eventually led to World War II, where finally new blood, new vital capacity that was appropriate to the, to the 20th century, right? People who weren't 19th century thinkers were then given the keys and they were able to rebuild an entire global system that got us all the way to where we are right now. The first three quarters of which was amazing. That just has to happen again. Right? The old guard of the, of the mid century um, has to hand the keys over to a new guard who have embodied capacity to actually be aware of where we are. Things like digital natives. If you're not a digital native, you need to stop trying to control things. And if you are a digital native, you gotta get your shit together and start using those tools and upgrade your, uh, your, your bravery, which is to say, in my language, your sovereignty, which is a lot of the stuff that you guys have been working on is being able to communicate. All right, how do I do that? How do I not be? All right, so I did this from the top. Let's do it from the bottom, which is, I think, a place that you guys really do a lot of. So let's take the people who are well positioned, are much maligned millennials. Um, one of the good consequences of our horrific education system is they don't actually know much about lots of stuff, um, which is actually not bad because in some sense it means they're not held back by, by stuff and they can learn new stuff. They can maybe try to rapidly bring in the right kinds of stuff, but here's what's holding back millennials. Um, they haven't built sovereignty. They haven't taken upon themselves the responsibility that they actually need to have to step into running the world. This extended adolescence, the fact that 35 year olds are ultimately where Ben Franklin was when he was nine is uh, the nature of that problem. And it means cognitive responsibility. You can't just drop into some prefab ideology that allows you to kind of dunk on people on the internet. That's not reality. That's adolescent bullshit. You need to grow up. What is it? Wake up, grow up, clean up, step up, something like that. Show up, I think. Show up. That's what needs to happen. It needs to happen en masse in particular for the people kind of like 35 and below, and, and the people by, by the way, 55 and below, and the people 65 and below. 85 and below, I think right now it's to button down and, and, and survive, but different variations on that theme. But stepping into sovereignty, psychological, emotional, spiritual, um, cognitive, um, you know, rapidly adopting and building adaptive capacities in the context of what is happening and what is real is the nature of the game at every single point. And this is more true than is usually the case. Because the nature of what is real now is that the answer to the question is in fact decentralized or distributed collective intelligence. The solution to World War II was the Blue Church. We've talked about this many times. It was a meritocratic, vertically integrated hierarchical system that used mass as its primary modality. Mass broadcast, mass production, that was the topological solution that was available in the mid-century, mid-20th century. That's not the answer now. The answer now is a continuous, connected network that uses spontaneous coordination, the ability to create bespoke solutions at the edge. Think about like micro-targeting and the danger of micro-targeting in the point of view of propaganda. But now think about micro-targeting and its opportunity at the level of empowerment. Our system right now has the capacity, or at least could have the capacity under wartime parameters in months, like three, four, five months, of using our collective wisdom, perception, and intelligence to generate a signal to literally every human being on the planet of precisely what they need to be most fully empowered to provide, to make the best choices for themselves and provide the best capacity into the world. So imagine right now if you had some kind of dashboard where the world was conspiring to provide you with the information you needed and the relationships and resources you needed to then simultaneously make you better at what you do and to allow you to give your best capacity back into the world. 
That's just, by the way, that's what this thing looks like. When it gets to maturity, that's what it looks like. And I'm not kidding. And we have the capacity to get there in a very short period of time. Mm. We probably won't, but at some point, I sure hope we do, because that's the only kind of thing that can actually respond to the magnitude, velocity, and complexity of what is happening and will continue to unfold in a series of phase transitions until we actually respond to it, unless we don't, in which case it collapses completely. Yeah, you mentioned, I mean, you've talked about collective intelligence in this context before, decentralized collective intelligence. And I wanted to just to quickly touch, uh, we're kind of coming to the end, but I just want to quickly touch on sense making in this context. And how, I remember I spoke to you and you said that the, the collective intelligence sense making around the virus was like two to three times, uh, or at least sort of two orders of magnitude higher than what was going on within the mainstream media. Yeah, we, we've put out and I think we'll put them out again underneath the in the show notes for this, like all of these amazing shared resources and uh, public documents that are linking together all of this kind of new information and the latest data and then what to do about lockdown, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So like that we are seeing it start to happen. Yep. But you fear that it's not going to be fast enough. I fear that it's not going to be fast enough. So let's give a nice, like another concrete example. Um, doctors and medical scientists right now are being hampered by the institutional silos that they are in. They're really, really wanting to have some kind of open, shared communications platform where the things that are being discovered at the edge, like the etiology of particular patient characteristics and the, high, the newest findings of like genetic. Uh, testing and, uh, on on the virus um, and uh, what, for, you know, whatever the science and the practice um, globally. Uh, what's going on in India? What's going on in China? What's going on in Singapore? What's going on in New York? What's going on in Yorkshire? Um, they want and need a capacity to completely boundaryless, like you know, fuck the bureaucracy. National Health Service, let your doctors run. CDC. The best thing the CDC could do right now would be to just let go and let the, the people at the edge begin the process of spontaneous coordinating. They're getting in the way like nobody's business. And the tools are getting in the way. So both the policies and the procedures and the tools, and to a lesser extent, because the psychology can change quite rapidly under these conditions, the psychology is getting in the way. Because they're an artificial bottleneck working on a broadcast model that insists on everything going through their system and it's just not, they're not capable of, of doing it. Yeah, so remember, I've said this like 15 times over the past five or six years publicly. Um, the blue church, like which is this particular construct of everything at the edge having to go up to the top to a set of decision makers who evaluate what's happening and then make a set of decisions and then propagate that set of decisions back down. Right? That's that approach. At its best, couldn't handle the velocity and complexity of what we're dealing with right now. And it is very, very far from being at its best. So now let's take that story and let's make it very concrete. Testing, swabs, CDC. So here's the deal. We have a testing methodology. We have a test, test kits. There are, in fact, a lot of test kits sitting in hospitals all over the country. The test kit involves a swab. That swab can pick up lots of things, by the way, including uh, COVID. It is entirely physically possible for the doctor, the hospital at the edge, to do a test on that swab and verify whether or not the patient being tested has or does not have the disease. They aren't doing that because the regulation requires them to send that swab up to the CDC to be tested, and then the data comes back from the CDC. Right. By the way, in true American style, what they could do is take two swabs. So you've got two nostrils. Send one up to the CDC and test the own, the one in their lab, and basically tell the CDC to fuck themselves. Uh, minimum, minimum compliance to stupid rules is kind of a good idea right now. In any event, that's a good example, right? It's just institutional incapacity. Right? Why is the CDC holding? this obligation, which can't work because it doesn't have the resources to handle the flux of input 
and the time delay between you know, just shipping something out here and coming back is a big deal. Right? It's a real problem. Why? Well, I mean, you could sort of go put on your tinfoil hat and start talking about conspiracies, and maybe, but more likely, a combination of, of senescent and fragile institutional structures and the feedback loop of um, uh, fear-based responses and the inability to move through the, uh, uh, the de denial and learning cycles. That's the most likely explanation. Something you pointed out that was really interesting that struck me um, that the, the difference in responses between different character types, and you mentioned kind of people on the right of the political spectrum, like Republicans who generally you would expect to be very disease phobic, they score much highly on um, kind of questions of purity and were actually responding very differently and were kind of really in denial for a lot longer than people on the other side. And there was all this narrative about what well, it's just a, it's just a Democrat um, fear mongering, it's just attacking Trump. And then we had this, this sort of catastrophic level of kind of denial followed by panic. Um, and then a complete change of that narrative, like you had Fox News go from this is all kind of made up to this is not made up and Trump is dealing with it and he's a war president in, the, in a matter of kind of hours almost. What do you make of that? Yeah, so I was quite confused by that. And I think we even had conversations on it in social media. Uh, and somebody gave me uh, the insight that I think is right, which is we're kind of dealing with a, a bit of a topsy-turvy um, unraveling of, of context. So two things happening simultaneously. One is, uh, at least in the US, and I think maybe broadly, uh, among political conservatives, among people who are in the right, there is a, a well-deserved conventional wisdom that the mainstream media is not our friend. Hmm. So a, a, a visceral response, an intuitive response that if the mainstream media is conveying something, particularly if they're conveying something with a high degree of urgency, hmm that it's probably wrong, it's probably false. And it's yet another example of them trying to kind of whip up um, unconscious response for agendas that are not in my best interest as a person from the right. Which is to mean to say that they had built over a long period of time a detection system and it gave them a false negative. Pay, you know, it's the boy who cried wolf, more or less. Cried wolf a hundred times, I've stopped listening to you. Oh shit, there's a wolf back in the life. The second thing, and kind of in the middle, is if you actually do have, at a dispositional level, a high orientation towards purity and towards strong, closed, clean borders, the gap that you have to get over between this isn't a problem to it is a problem is actually quite high. If you have to actually go through a whole bunch of, oh shit, this is actually a really big problem because you're, your disposition will perceive this as actually being a much bigger issue. Mm -hmm. So on the one hand, you have this denial vector, which is, fuck them, they cry wolf. We know these guys are a manipulative liars who don't have our best interest in mind. I have a heuristic of not listening to them. And, oh, if I do listen to them, then this is going to really be scary and bad. And I actually feel quite powerless because I don't have any way of responding to the violation of our boundaries and purity at this level. So this kind of reinforces a delusionary denial mindset. Mm. That was perfectly actually. And there's also but when you hit when you hit when you hit the moment of clarity, mm. when something hits, and usually by the way it goes at the level of, of uh, leaders. Like, so like when Tucker Carlson, who has a lot of people like he's he doesn't fit this criteria. We trust Tucker on the right. Tucker's like, oh, okay. You know, if, if he says something, he's definitely not the kind of guy. He's actually several times over the past couple of years spoken truth to power from the point of view of the right in a way that feels like it's even more honest. So when he says, No, it's a big deal, pay attention. Then suddenly it's like, shit, I can't go with the boy who cries wolf. He's not the boy who cries wolf. Now I've got to go through the denial thing and figure out how to adjust to the reality of it. But then you kind of, this whole construct flips and then you settle into the base, which is conservatives respond as a, oh shit, this is a violation of purity and integrity. And now we, it's a crisis. Like, so it moves from denial to crisis pretty quickly if you're landing in kind of that natural disposition. Yeah, that, that feels right. And the other part is just the motivated reasoning of like on both on all sides of the political spectrum, you just see people intuit what the end game would be if this was true. Therefore, it can't be true. For example, the end game being there's going to be a big hit to the economy and that will harm 
Trump's re-election chances, therefore it cannot be true. So, right, right. Yeah, like, the, uh, like, we, the, we, the, cla which, which the classic is story of... If you think about it, it's a fascinating psychological mechanism because it means that subconsciously we are able to play that out without being conscious of it and then refuse to play it out consciously because we've realized where it would go if we actually did it. Yep, happens all the time, right? When, yeah. you, when you, uh, you, know, you, you walk somebody through... You know, you're sitting in a, in a city that has a, a, you know, a plant, like a, a chemical plant. And you're talking about the negative impacts of the chemical plant's operations on the, the local river. And you, and you take, keep it very tactical. Like, yeah, we've got the river and in the water supply and the fish and the frogs and the chemicals that are being output in the river having these consequences. And smart people are paying attention. They're nodding. Yep, yep, yep. And you kind of show, you, you see these curves and how that works. Like, yep, get it. And, you, like, and also there's a point where suddenly the conclusion is, I'm going to lose my job. And there's a retcon of the entire, and suddenly things that they had agreed to explicitly 15 minutes before, they are now disputing with the absolute level of, uh, you know, with vigor. Mm. So yeah, that's for sure. That's a real thing. That's a, it's a big deal, right? And I think it's actually kind of important to recognize that that's the case and recognize that that whole cycle is part of the cycle. Like it's not good enough to have done this cognitively. You kind of have to absorb the implications in a full body sense. Like you have to actually process the whole implication, the whole consequence. And you have to do it, by the way, not just here, but all the way through. You just have had to have had your response and not have gotten stuck in any level of denial. Like go through the whole process and not had a little piece of you say, ah, I don't want to deal with that. I'll, I'll go into denial now. Really, you know, integrate the whole thing. Then you're fully in acceptance. Then you can go through it. Yeah, th there's an interesting story that really fits with this that I heard earlier today. A friend of mine called Dougald Hine talked about how he had a meeting with the government during the swine flu crisis in the UK. I think it was swine flu or it might have been foot and mouth. I, can't, I think it might have been foot and mouth, actually. Mm. Yeah, yeah. The meeting with the government advisor and outlined what it meant. There was a big outbreak in, in Mexico and he kind of explained what it... And then midway through the meeting, after about an hour, he realized he wasn't arguing what, with, with someone who was trying to decide what the right thing was to do. It was what is the most that I can sell to the media. Mm, mm -hmm. And that that for me feels like a very deep, um, a very deep systemic flaw. And it's one I'm paying att particular attention to at the moment in the UK. Like the UK strategy seems almost entirely based on that. Like if we signal panic now, having signaled that we're kind of quite easy and we're, we're talking about herd immunity. If we signal panic now, it will invalidate like what will the media think of us? And it's like. That, that, to me, feels like a very deep, if you, you outline China as being the opposite of that, it's like, I, I don't give a shit because public opinion is, is completely irrelevant and Russia is the same. Like that seems to be a deep systemic flaw with representative democracy that they don't feel they can level with us uh, about reality and therefore there's a kind of untruth built into the system. And, and then there's, a, there's also a responsibility on the media there because the media often will overplay things and so you get these sort of multiple failure conditions where no one feels they can be honest because they'll freak people out and then then everyone's just making decisions yeah. based on what will be thought of them and the rather than the the decisions in themselves it's like artificiality does that work is that sort of you've mentioned Baudrillard's idea of simulation yeah is that the process that he talked about um well he doesn't talk about the reverse like he does definitely talk about that yeah, and I think that's right. That's a very good frame. I mean, it's a little bit uh, <laughs> philosophically intense to use as a, a a frame, but yeah. So, but I think we can actually make it reasonably again concrete. Um, and actually, you threw out the, the notion of wartime president, and I think that's a good distinction. There's just a difference between peacetime and wartime. Hmm. Um, and one of the problems, of course, is with peacetime is that this notion of simulation can work, and, and in many cases, it's actually not necessarily the worst thing to do. Um, there's like a, a, an intuition and a practicality of managing the crisis. How, how do I keep people from panicking? How do I stay in control? It's funny, like, as I'm saying this at the level of like political sociology, think about it from the level of individual psychology as well. How do I stay in control? Um, how do I make sure that, that uh, the things that I want to happen happen the way I want them to happen? And of course, what happens is that like if you're Boris Johnson or the Trump administration or, you know, their opposite number on the other side of the aisle or any, you know, 
agency head in any regulatory environment where I've got this kind of agenda where I'm thinking, okay, I've got a lot of different things I need to take care of. I've got to take care of my pension. I've got to take care of this deal I've got over here. I've got to make sure I look good. I've got to think about my political, like all these different characteristics of what I'm trying to manage. And the method that I'm trying to use is this notion of managing other people's perceptions. That's the key. Managing other people's perceptions is the tool that is selected for in a, in a peacetime environment, in an environment where um, Baudrillard simulation, level two or level three or level four uh, are in place, where reality can be avoided. I don't have the consequences that come back to me at the level of society, at the level of human humans, are significantly more meaningful than the reality that comes back to me through nature, through reality. So I think it's worth mentioning what, not outlining completely, but just that Baudrillard level two, three, and four are just increasing levelers, levels of artificiality in the system or, or, dis, or deceit and dishonesty. It, it, call it like, almost like distance from nature mm. and an embeddedness of increasingly kind of things that are dominated by the about how, by how humans do things. So you might imagine like, um, I, I'm somebody who lives out in, in the woods by myself and my pipe breaks. That's kind of level zero. I am hands-on directly with reality, physical reality. And the pipe doesn't give a fuck what story I tell myself. I either fixed it or I didn't. Right, so it's very simple. Okay, layer two. Um, I, I call a plumber. Right, so both my capacity for agency of actually solving the problem, and in some sense, my capacity of perception of knowing whether the problem was solved adequately is mediated by another human being. So narrative enters into it, right? I have to find some social mechanism. In this case, money, by the way, is a variation on narrative. I have to find some social mechanism of getting this other human to do a thing. And that's the simulation level one, right? Narrative actually now becomes more important for my success than direct relationship with nature. Okay, let's go to, to, to level, level two. Um, I don't even know plumber. I wouldn't even know what to tell the plumber. I have to call the supervisor, the super of the building. I have yet another person. Um, and the super, by the way, I have to convince the super that it's a good idea. Right? I've got this whole sort of back and forth set of political dynamics and layers where um, you know, the super is busy. And the super's got different values, and maybe this isn't isn't an issue for the super to deal with. You know, maybe it's a, you know, it's a, a, a squeaky faucet. It's not a it's not a leak. You know, like, hey, I need the plumber to come fix my. I need somebody to come fix my my faucet, and I have to go through this political mechanization. We have to do like performative signaling and political maneuvering. And I got to figure out how to like manage the perceptions of this agent, who themselves then has to manage the perceptions of an agent. So I'm like two degrees away from it. Let's go to layer three. Um, now we're in the, in the fact that we're in a layer where storytelling is the medium. So like I'm a journalist. So what I'm doing is I'm actually, the, I'm not dealing with now a, a problem in physical reality. I'm dealing with a problem in narrative reality. What are the stories that people are telling? Right? It is the rare journalist who goes all the way to the, to the pipe and says, ah, yep, leak. I've, I've leveled up in the capacity to determine, yeah, that's a leak. That's a real problem. The journalist is interviewing other people. They're talking to, ideally, they're talking to the plumber. They're probably talking to the super. They may be talking to the poor bastard at the top. And the journalist is not in the business of solving the problem at the level of the ground. The journalist is in the business of creating a narrative that goes, percolates out through multiple layers of narrative. Let's go to layer four. Now, finally, I've got the politician. And the politician is communicating not to people, not to supers, not to plumbers, and definitely not to pipes, but to the media, right? And of course, what happens when you're in that level of depth, the, the niche, you know, what it means to be successful, is increasingly in the direction of actually selecting for bullshit, which is to say selecting for highly salient, the th kinds of things that our sense-making system, human perception thinks is important and true, but not necessarily at all relevant, right? Can I tell a good story? Is the story compelling? You know, is it a, would it sell in Hollywood? That kind of thing. And it's perception management 101. So I'm actually kind of in real time trying to figure out what's the movie. And when I'm a political operator, it's sort of level four. And when the whole culture is now kind of sitting in level four, because we don't, none of us are connected to, to the pipe. Um, now we're in Baudrillard level four. And um, sorry, we went a long way down that path, but mm. I wanted to use that as a metaphor. But the point is, 
um, wartime, peacetime. So in, in the peacetime army, and by the way, peacetime civilization, the peacetime country, this movement towards the top of the stack, toward deeper into the Baudrillard environment is, it can be done. Right? You can kind of, uh, you can be more successful. You will be more successful virtue signaling than being virtuous. Okay, if, I can, if other people believe I'm a hero, it's much more important than whether I am a hero. And by the way, if I am a hero, if I blow the whistle, the whistleblower, I might just be thrown in jail. And so if bizarrely enough, actual virtue is oftentimes punished and virtue signaling is oftentimes rewarded. And this is what creates corruption in the choice making system. War, in this metaphor, and war practically in many cases, is when reality comes rushing back to hit you in the face. It's that moment of clarity of level of the simulation. Um, you know, the, the general who is very, very good at spinning things to make himself look good, but at the end of the day is incompetent. And I don't know if you know the history of World War II, but manages the Battle of Kasserine Pass, where the American, uh, the American army for the very first time met the German army in North Africa and got fucked. Um, well, a whole bunch of dead people and burned down tanks is, is kind of hard to spin. Mm -hmm. When people care, they're paying close attention. They're like, oh, shit. Like, no, you fucked up, dude. You must be a shitty general. And this could actually, that, that, that you kind of do that forward projection. Oh, shit. This could actually end up with like the Germans winning the war. This would be a bad thing. Like you can actually, I, I, don't, like the, I don't like the consequences of having shitty generals right now. I need to stop having shitty generals. Oh, how do I get rid of shitty generals? Right? And so you begin to relearn the process of at the end of the day, you actually have to know whether or not the pipe's going to burst and try to fix it. Right? And so kind of these cycles of at a meta systemic level of going through a process of kind of going into the simulation and separating virtue and virtue signaling, and then coming back from the simulation and rapidly learning that virtue signaling is oftentimes the best virtue signalers are almost certainly the least virtuous people because they've been optimizing for simulation. And the most virtuous people oftentimes are awkward fucking virtue signalers. They look shitty, but, they're actually really good. And so reorienting your capacity to make that discernment and then making your choice go, you know what? People who are actually engaging in personally damaging heroic activities have to be supported and rewarded. Otherwise, we're all going to go down with the ship. That's that evolution. Yeah, this has been a fantastic conversation. I just like to, to round it off with, you mentioned war, wartime, and I, I used to be a, a producer for Channel 4 News. I was in uh, Libya, the, I mean, the most intense environment that I was in was in Misrata uh, when it was sealed off and we we were there. Basically, the only way in was by boat. Gaddafi's army was attacking it. Uh, Tim Hetherington and Chris Honros had just been killed. So it was kind of very heated. They had kind of bombs dropping on the city. I, did, I don't know if I enjoyed it. I, I was in kind of combat zone a couple of times after that. And I... And I have to say the feeling, the feeling that, it, that I was feeling in London this last, this last week of sort of ramp, ratcheting up of tension and, and of tension and kind of more and more increased super awareness of kind of, is that person coughing? And like just, just this kind of also increased awareness of just the tension of, of everyone around me. And then your kind of nervous system starts to kind of speed up and you're um, yep. felt very, very similar. Like it felt let's, like let's, let's, def let's define war. I think I think I think what you're saying is actually very very right. And obviously, I've actually been and, using and it also that. it's this sort of sense of something coming in through your pores almost. Right. This this sense of like intensity and th there's an, what I'm going to do as well. Just I want to lodge this. I I did an amazing interview with a guy who made a film. He's an Israeli film director. He made a film about the Lebanon war that he experienced, and he was a he was a tank gunner in that war, and he made a film where you are stuck inside the tank for the whole two hours of the film to try and convey what it, mm. it felt like. And he talked beautifully and lyrically about how war gets into every pore of your body and how it just becomes this all encompassing thing. I'll put a link in the show notes to this interview because it's, it's amazing. He talked about it beautifully. Sorry, you, you go for it. Oh, great. So, so what I, what I want to do is I want to say, okay, let's use that, but then you know, let's use it, use it rightly. And right? we do, we don't want to overly map war so things like tanks that's a that's a kind of a good example uh world war ii or, or vietnam uh, libya these are good examples of war but it's not the whole of war war is when 
choices are being made in very high levels of uncertainty where the consequences will be very real and oftentimes very rapid. That's war. That's what war is. War is that situation. And so in some sense, we're fighting, we find ourselves in a wartime posture often. War is like the exact inverse of addiction, the exact inverse of denial. Like your choices matter right now. Like if you didn't buy food two or three weeks ago, you're showing up at grocery stores going, fuck, what just happened? And so your choice back then was uncertain. Should I be buying food too now? What, why? That makes no sense. It's no good idea. You're uncertain. And it matters. Now you may actually find that you don't have enough food, which you might be feeling a little bit concerned about right now. And rapidly. In two weeks, you found out whether or not your choice was a good one. That's war. And in our environment, as the magnitude of that goes up, right? so not having enough you know, ho-hos is not that much of a problem. And being shot at is a big problem. And being shot at by malevolent actors who are good at what they do is an even bigger problem. Um, but we're facing a situation where the, the, the uncertainty is growing. Mm. The magnitude of the consequences is growing. And the speed of the choices is accelerating. That's why people are having a visceral sense of, oh, wait, and particularly anybody who's actually been in combat, yeah, okay, this feels like that because it is that. It's just happening in a way that we're not familiar with. We're not being, nobody's going to drop a nuke on Manhattan. But the net net consequences of the entire systemic uh, envelope unfolding may be very similar and the, and at the edge, like the, at the edge of what could happen here. There may be a situation where, for example, you know, the streets of Rome right now are more or less empty. The collapse of Rome back in, uh, I think, 800 or so. Do you know that story? Like, this is actually the kind of thing that people really need to get. Fuck, sorry, this is way too, there's so much going on here. I, I hope this isn't an overload. I hate overwhelming people. But so in like 500 AD, something like that, maybe 400, 400 AD, the population of the city of Rome, ancient Rome, was 1.2 million people, more or less. 300 years later, without the use of nuclear weapons, right, just the use of systemic collapse across a wide variety of different uh, fronts, the population had gone down to like 10,000 people. Three orders of magnitude from 1.2 million to 10,000 people over what is effectively a very short period of time. And then it stayed there until 1939. Hmm. Right? That's what systemic collapse looks like. Now, I don't, I'm not saying that necessarily that will happen here, but the point is if, if you realize that topologically, this idea of uncertainty velocity and magnitude by magnitude i mean the fact that reality really happens the choices really have consequences is what war feels like that's the way of thinking about the nature of why, why we are now in a wartime situation there you go cool thank you jordan that was really a uh, fantastic conversation so stay safe and um look forward to catching up again soon all right man bye bye rebel wisdom is a new sense-making platform bringing together the most rebellious and inspiring thinkers from around the world. If you're enjoying our content, then you can help us make more by becoming a subscriber, which will give you access to a load of exclusive films. Also, you can then join our group Zoom calls to discuss the ideas in the films, and you can send us ideas for questions for upcoming interviews. We're also looking for talented people to help us out with editing, graphics, music, that kind of thing. And if you're a regular viewer, you'll know we talk a lot about the value of embodying or actually living out the ideas that we talk about. So that's why we run regular events in London. Check out the links on the website for more. And hope to see you soon.